Our first speaker will be Dr. Leslie Gordon, who is the Professor of Pediatrics Research at Brown University and co-founder of the Progeria Research Foundation. She will be presenting on a Hutchinson-Guilford Progeria Syndrome case study. Thank you. All right, thank you everybody. It's been a wonderful, wonderful meeting and I hope I can add a little bit to it. Um, I've been asked to talk to you not about uh, biomarkers necessarily, but about some of the um, lessons we've learned in the field of Hutchinson-Guilford progeria syndrome um, to bring us from preclinical studies, cellular and mouse, into the clinic in this ultra rare disease. Uh, next slide, please. These are my disclosures. Next slide. And these are the children that we are trying to save, children from all over the world with progeria. Next slide. Progeria is a premature aging syndrome. It is, um, it, it is an ultra rare disease. It is autosomal dominant uh, genetic disease, which I'll talk to you a little pre and post about how important that's been for us. And the children all die of premature atherosclerosis, the same kind of um, atherosclerosis that you see in 60, 70 and 80 year olds. And without treatment, they pass away at an average age of 14 and a half years. Next, please. Now, these are some of the clinical signs of progeria. Um, it is a multi-system disease. I'm gonna concentrate in my case study on the cardiovascular aspects, but what you see here on the left is um, that they have a severe failure to thrive almost uh, from, from almost birth, uh, starting at a few months of age, and that it affects multiple systems. But the mouse model studies and the human studies that I'm gonna concentrate on focus mostly on the cardiovascular aspects of this, since that's what causes the children to die. Next slide, please. Um, so the cardiovascular disease includes a progressive global atherosclerosis leading to heart failure and strokes. And what you're seeing here is a five-year-old uh, with a carotid artery, complete obstruction on the right. Next. Um, but what I wanna show you also is the pathology of disease because I'm gonna, I'm gonna tie this in with the mouse models that I'm gonna show you. Um, the children develop calcific plaques, which is not easy to generate in any mouse model, um, but they have a thickened fibrotic adventitia and their, the media of their blood vessels is, um, becomes, as, they, as the disease develops, um, de almost devoid of cells, of smooth muscle cells, and that's replaced by extracellular ma matrix deposition. So what, that's what you're seeing up here on the top. And then non-HGPS on the bottom is an older individual with, with atherosclerosis. Next, please. Okay, and this is how, two of the ways that we measure this in the clinic. And this is gonna, especially the pulse wave velocity on the left, um, be very informative for the presentation about the mouse models. Um, pulse wave, carotid femoral pulse wave velocity is essentially the rate at which blood can get from the neck to the femoral area. And when, when you have a stiff pipe, when the vasculature is very stiff as in progeria, um, the blood has to move a lot faster and, um, and that, increases the pulse wave velocity. So a higher number means a stiffer vessel. And you see the normal range here, age matched is five to six and a half and all of the circles of children with progeria untreated and their um, levels are very, very high. Um, and this is, uh, this is a very important uh, measure in the clinic because this is one of the major outcome parameters that we use. And you're seeing this sort of pathologically by echo uh, on the right as brightness, vascular wall brightness on the right here versus the left means that there's a lot of dense extracellular matrix in the vessel wall. Next, please. Well, we knew something about progeria before the gene mutation, but the gene mutation discovery opened incredible doors for us um, in regard to being able to design, um, get support for preclinically, and then move into the clinic. So in 2003, um, the um, uh, Francis Collins's lab, um, in collaboration with us, led by him, discovered the gene mutation for progeria. Next slide, please. And this is essentially what it is. Um, the 
the, the gene mutation lies in the gene lamin LMNA, which produces a protein called lamin A. And lamin A lines the inner membrane of nuclear nuclei. It binds to chromatin, affects transcription. It has both structural and cell sig signaling effects. And importantly, it's in expressed in uh, most different, all differentiated cell types. But progerin, uh, which is um, the causal protein in progeria, not the lack of lamin A, but the presence of progerin, is a shortened um, uh, protein, abnormal lamin A protein, that also has problems with its post-translational processing. So we've got a, a, an abnormal protein that, that, is not cross, that is short and not processed properly, present in the nuclei of differentiated cell types. Next slide, please. So after the gene mutation uh, was discovered, we could diagnose children properly. We didn't have to deal with misdiagnoses like we had in the past. And we could produce progerin producing um, cell models and mouse models and in an effort to move us into clinic um, more accurately. Next, please. The, the, here I'm showing you sort of the hallmark, and there are many ways to, to measure, uh, to find abnormalities in cells, but this is our sort of hallmark sign uh, of what happens to cells, uh, culture cells in progeria. There is nuclear blebbing, as you can imagine, the abnormal protein in the nucleus is tethering and pulling in, in ways that cause blebbing. Uh, it increases with passage number and it causes the cells to die early. Next, please. But this is a slide showing you the, the sort of hallmark mouse models. Now, there are, there are a number of mouse models for progeria, but I, I'm just going to talk to you about the two that I think have really guided the field in a powerful way. They are both progerin producing, and that I think is very important. Uh, one was produced in the Collins lab. It's, um, it's a back transgenic bacterial artificial chromosome transgenic. So it has, the back has a human um, gene in it, producing the uh, G608G mutation that causes progeria. Progerin is produced in these mice. And then secondly, there's a knock-in model where the, um, the mouse gene is mutated. That's a G609G. So it, it has sort of a mouse progeria. Progerin is also produced in that. And they're different from each other, but they complement each other in wonderful ways. And the second, the G609G was produced in the Lopez Oteen lab. Um, they're both small. They both develop cardiovascular disease, but at least early on uh, and even medium on, um, they don't have plaques. They both die early, but as in a lot of mouse models, we don't know exactly why they die. And they, as I said, they both produce progerin. Um, and what you can see here on the right is the cardiovascular disease. The wild type aorta on the top looks very different from that on the bottom, which is basically devoid of, of cells. It's late on and a lot of the smooth muscle cells have died off. Next slide, please. Okay, here I'm just showing you the post-translational processing of laminae on the left and progerin on the right, just to demonstrate that our first clinical trial treatment ever for children with progeria was, um, was born out of the gene mutation understanding and the, and the tr post-translational processing of the protein. So it's biologically based. I'm gonna call, it's lon called lonifarnib. And the category for this drug is farnesyl transferase inhibitors or FTIs. And that's what I'm gonna focus on in our first sort of studies that bridge to trial. Um, next, please. Okay, so this is, this is sort of a summary of some of the data that brought us to trial. On the top left, you're looking at um, fibroblast cultures treated with a farnesyl transferase inhibitor, and that normalizes the nuclear shape. And on the bottom, you're looking at um, the vessels, the blood vessels from a mouse model that is progerin producing, treated with an, an FTI, not the one we used in clinic, and on the left panel, you see an untreated um, aorta in the middle, treated mouse aorta, and on the right, um, a wild type. And obviously the treated mouse um, is, uh, is in much better shape. Next slide, please. All right, so what you're seeing here is the clinical trial results. On the left, we've got pulse wave velocity drastically improved by the end of the study. In the middle, echo density improved. And on the right is a Kaplan-Meier curve 
with the blue untreated and red treated children and obviously, um, th and there was um, an improvement in, in survival in these kids. So that's the story of great translation. Um, next slide, please. Next, okay. And, but now, um, I'm, ooh, next, I guess we're gonna keep going down. Why don't you keep going till all of the treatments are showing? Terrific. Now, what I wanna show you here is just that we've run several types of clinical trials, all sort of based on the pathology of how the abnormal protein is produced. After the lonofarnib study, we added two prenylation inhibitors, a little more upstream, but biologically based. And um, we added pravastatin and zoledronate. Next, go to the next, um, keep going to the next slide. Keep going. There we go. Now, just in a nutshell, what I'm going to show you here is, is, a, is a bit of weakness, a, a lesson learned along the way. Um, we had some cellular studies, as you're sh shown up here on the left, um, showing that yes, nuclear shape was improved with the bisphosphonate and statin. And on the right, a mouse model, that's a progeroid mouse model, but not a progerin producing mouse model that was used um, at the time because that's kind of all we had. Um, and so this ZIMSD24 mouse model is a bit different from progeria. It doesn't develop heart disease, cardiovascular disease, it, but it, and it does fracture, it gets spontaneous fractures and neurological deficits, unlike those with progeria. And I think that's pretty important because that may be the reason why they, one of the main reasons why they die, maybe lots of fractures and bis bisphosphonates would have helped that. And in the human trials, we did not see a benefit of these two drugs over and above lonofarnib. Um, so for us, that was a bit of a lesson learned in which model um, should be used or could be used, although this is a great animal model, maybe not optimal for progeria. Next slide, please. Okay, so, um, you know, he, I'm going to flip back to one of the progerin producing mouse models and talk about how optimizing and communicating and optimizing care for that model has, has really changed us and helped us a lot. Um, only recently, uh, in the last uh, couple of years, a Jay Humphrey from Yale started using a soft-based chow, introducing a caretaker mouse, taker mouse, and was able to increase the average lifespan of these mouse, mice significantly. And this allowed the cardiovascular phenotype to actually worsen and become much more similar to that observed in, clinically in patients. Um, and the vessels got very stiff, but also we saw vascular calcification. Next, please. And so what you're seeing here on the left is the ability to measure carotid femoral, uh, measure pulse wave velocity, excuse me, a, a measure of pulse wave velocity in the original mouse model, not at 103 days, the average at, at first, but at, after 168 days, look how high that is. So the animal husbandry and the care really helped. And then what you're seeing on the right is that it did improve with lonofarnib treatment. So this is a perfect now way to say, oh my gosh, this improvement is gonna help us get to the clinic with drugs that have more um, potential for benefit. Next, please. So, you know, I wanna finish out by uh, concluding and providing a couple of suggestions for maybe centralizing resources and you know, using these two examples these, that I've, I've shown you in an effort to optimize preclinical studies across an entire field. Um, one is very inexpensive and one is very expensive. Um, so here's the first one, um, essentially getting the word out, um, sharing information that might be really important, the devil's in the details, um, collecting and distributing best practices and guidance for basic scientists through scanning new publications, investigator surveys, and then doing email blitzes or having a resource source center like we do at PRF um, in, in our cell and tissue bank. Uh, next, please. And then finally, I mean, this was this is a big uh, this is a big project, but centra centralizing disease specific animal testing could be key to an entire field. We haven't done this yet. But think about if, um, if, if, the, if the, the primary animal models are all available in the same place, treated in the same way, you can choose that, the candidate interventions, the investigators can be very involved, um, survival studies would be very consistent, pathology, 
and some basic phenotypes. And then tissues or other things can be sent to investigators, uh, even the mice, for specialized analysis. And I think that's, you know, it is an expensive way to go, but I think that is, an, it could be very powerful in, in goals to make things consistent and get to trials. Next, please. In the field of progeria, we have a long way to go. We are still learning these lessons. I've just shown you a few, but we have um, small molecules and RNA therapeutics and genetic editing that we're working on. And we're using these lessons to try to get us into clinical trials to help and save these children. And a very, uh, you know, you can only, with a very rare disease, you can only do one, maybe two. We've never done that uh, trials at a time. You have to be really careful, obviously, in what you choose. Next, please. Thank you very, very much. And uh, again, I've, been, I've, I've really enjoyed this meeting. It's been fantastic and I look forward to the discussion.